minutos. Es una vez de, por favor, confirmarme que me estén escuchando correctamente a través del chat. Eh, mientras tanto, mientras recibo sus confirmaciones, eh, permítanme darles unas recomendaciones. Eh, por favor, recuerden que como preferencia utilicemos los navegadores Google Chrome o Mozilla Firefox. Eh, igual, cierren todas las aplicaciones que puedan interferir con, la transmis eh, con las transmisiones de audio. Esto nos ayudará a que ustedes escuchen mejor. Ya estoy ajustando la ganancia. Eh, igual, si tienen problemas con su audio, por favor, eh, repórtenmelo por el chat. Eh, si es un problema general, eh, estaré deteniendo la sesión para que revisemos cuál es el problema. En caso contrario, por favor, les pedimos de nuevo tratar de cerrar las aplicaciones, eh, revisar sus bocinas, incrementar el volumen, eh, o en general, eh, recordemos que esto ahora se incrementa un poquito el acceso a internet, entonces, pues, cuando seamos pacientes. Recordemos que al final de la presentación estaremos revisando todas sus preguntas, por favor, guárdenlas para el final. Y eh, a partir de este momento, la sesión estará siendo grabada y recuerden que estará disponible a través del canal de Software Guru. El día de hoy, eh, la presentación que vamos a dar es How to Build a Successful Resume. Este webinar lo estará impartiendo su servidor. Eh, mi nombre es Ariel García. Eh, les comento eh, rápidamente, eh, por mi parte soy un ingeniero en sistemas, egresado del TEC de Monterrey y maestro en ingeniería industrial por parte del Georgia Institute of Technology. Eh, estoy certificado en Six Sigma Grimfeld y Lean Enterprise. Estas eh, certificaciones las obtuve en Estados Unidos. Eh, tengo experiencia profesional en la industria financiera, salud, telecomunicaciones. Eh, tengo también dos años como docente eh, a nivel licenciatura y preparatoria en el ITAM y en el TEC de Monterrey, donde actualmente doy clases de matemáticas en inglés. Entonces, sin más preámbulo, eh, me gustaría empezar con el tema. Eh, para ello, eh, y esto se los eh, propongo, eh, si por ahí no les agrada la idea, por favor déjenme saberlo, pero toda la presentación está en inglés y la intención es que la realicemos también en inglés, eh, para que ustedes también vayan practicando su listening. Y bueno, ¿no? en caso de que haya por ahí algún temita de que algo no se me entienda, etc., con confianza déjenme saberlo. Pero la idea es que toda esta presentación la revisemos en idioma inglés como práctica para todos. Entonces, vamos a hacer el switch. Ok, as I said before, today we're going to start uh, with a little bit of information about what we want to learn. And again, what are we going to learn today? First of all, uh, I'm going to give you some tips, some very important tips that are going to be useful for you if you want to build a successful resume. Now, what is the goal of this? The goal of this presentation is that if you want to apply for a job abroad, and mainly I'm thinking about a job in the US or Canada, you want to provide information about you in a way that it will be really good to advertise yourself. So if you advertise yourself correctly, you will be able to get uh, not only a good job, but also a good start in your professional career. So today we're going to review some of the main tips that I could find and that I'm aware of about how to build a successful resume. So we're going to review very quickly what's the difference between a resume and a curriculum vitae, what is and is not a resume, some of the basic uh, elements that your resume should include, and some specific hints for many of the parts that you will find in your resume. And let me be clear about something. Last week, we have our SG Virtual Congress, and we also have a chat about how to build a successful resume, but in Mexico, we know it as curriculum vitae, uh, in Spanish. So I'm not going to cover the same points. Actually, this presentation will actually uh, provide additional information that you should use when you're building your resume. So for more details about how to write down your objective, your summary, your education, or your work experience, you will find that in the other presentation, the one that we had last week, that it's also available through Software Guru in the portal site of SG Conference. So again, we're not going to repeat that information, and actually the best idea will be to review this presentation and the one that we had last week. So that being said, 
I just want to point out something really, really important, which is, what is the difference between a resume and a curriculum vitae? In the US and in Canada, the goal of a resume is to construct a professional identity. And again, it's the typical document, as we know here in Mexico, as curriculum vitae. The difference is that in Canada or the US, a curriculum vitae, the goal it's quite specifically to construct a scholarly identity. What does this mean? It means that for a curriculum vitae, the goal is that you want to get a job in the academic field. That's why the difference between a resume is the curriculum vitae is longer, it covers your entire career, and the content is always static. It depends information about what are you doing or what have you been doing so far in your professional career. The difference with a resume is it's short, it's brief, it has no particular format rule. You can see uh, different ways to build your resume. And the most important one is highly customizable. The thing that is highly customizable, it means that it's going to help you to adapt this document so that it will provide the best information in greater impact to your employers. So what that is the main difference. Resume, you're looking for a job in the private or public company. The difference between uh, curriculum vitae is that you want to get a job academic field. Now, providing a little bit more information, what a resume is. What a resume is, is a marketing piece that creates interest. It's going to be a brief but very persuasive summary, summary about your accomplishments, qualifications, and experience. And again, it's the best tool that you have in order to get the attention of my employer and explain to them why should be you the company's next hire. And again, we have to take advantage that uh, this is highly customizable. So what is my recommendation? The same as happened in Spanish. One size does not fit all. What does that mean? We have to be specific. We have to create more than one resume for the different type of jobs that we're looking for. I mean, we cannot have a general resume for all the jobs that we want to apply. We want to be specific. And in US, in the US and Canada, they like to have personalized resumes. I mean, if you're looking for a job in a specific company, even you should mention the name of the company. We're going to see some examples about that. But again, you have to be as specific as possible. And actually, if you're planning to look for a job in the US or in Canada, many of the job search tools like Monster or Job Search, even Yahoo Jobs now, allow you to have more than one resume in your profile, even here in Mexico. Uh, also see, as, a, as far as I know, it also let you have more than one resume. So you should try, you should do the extra effort to customize your resume for the specific job that you're looking for. Now, what a resume is not, uh, and to be quick about this is again, it's not a historical document. You do not have to list all your jobs and all your responsibilities that you have so far. The important goal in this is you have to be brief. You have to show that you're capable of synthesizing information, that you have to provide uh, also the, the skill that you're proficient with the language. So remember, just stick to the facts and provide accurate information in a brief way. Now let's talk a little bit about the basics, the basics about how you should build your resume. And again, this was mentioned before, but it's important that you check this uh, again in the last presentation that we had last week. When do you use a single page resume versus a two page resume? And considering that the two page resume should be only for those who have more than five years of experience. And try to keep it in two. Three is too much. I mean, honestly, and, and, and I remind myself again, you have to show that you care simplify that you can provide information, quality information in a short amount of space. So again, two page at most for five years or more of experience, and you have less than five years, 
you consider you should consider only using one page only. Now, regarding the font size, again, the recommendation will be 10 to 12 uh, uh, points in your font. The type of fonts that you should use mainly is Times New Roman, Arial, or some similar fonts. Also, you should consider uh, use uh, space, bolding, and even font size for emphasis. And again, you should not try to be uh, too creative with this. Just stick to something that is simple. You should not use more than two fonts in your resume. Maybe you could use one font specifically for headings and for information on description, you could use another. But again, you should not play too much with that. Uh, and again, you should maintain an adequate balance between the white space and the text or type. That is something really, really important that we need to do. So let's move on. Another basic is what should you include in your resume? It's the same as in Spanish. Uh, your contact information, your objective or summary, and we will see when you should use an objective or a summary, your work experience and your education. That's the must that you should provide. And again, depending on your experience, you should also provide optionally, but it should be a must if you are an, uh, a person related with IT technology, your computer skills, your language, any certification that you have, or any professional memberships. That's something really, really important that you should include. And again, maybe you uh, just graduated from school, then you should include, for instance, honors or awards that you have during your studies, volunteer experience, if you have any, hobbies and interests, and maybe community service. Nowadays, it's something that is getting... And again, this type of information, you should only include it if you just graduated from school. Otherwise, you should stick only to these main options. Now, what you should not include in your resume, and this is also similar in Spanish, any salary demands or expectations. Uh, that looks really, really bad. Also in the US and Canada, you should not include what you, uh, what you want to earn unless they ask. If they ask you explicitly to tell them what, how much money you want to earn, then you should put it. Otherwise, you must not. Now, what else? Preference for work schedules based off or overtime. That's something that you should not include. Uh, that's mainly also in the US because sometimes uh, you should work by hour. Here in Mexico, we're not familiar with this, but again, you should not include it. Comments on fringe benefits. What is fringe benefits? If you at some point in your life will uh, find this term. Fringe benefits, it's uh, what we call um, here in Mexico, some benefits that are not of general, uh, you know, they are not common for everybody. You no, know? uh, you know, for instance, extra holidays or maybe uh, a car or special insurance, uh, special benefits that are something that the company is providing to the employee that is far beyond uh, the general population. So that's what we call fringe benefits. So if you're looking for fringe benefits, please do not include them. I mean, that's something that you will discuss uh, in the future during the interview. You should also avoid uh, specific information like height, weight, age, uh, any disabilities that you may have, comments about your personal life. Photograph, this is also important. Um, unless they also uh, ask you for it, do not include your photograph. It's really not typical. Your tax ID number, again, in Mexico is the RFC. You should not include it or your social security number. No, you should also not include it. And that's for security reasons. Now, we're going to go specifically now to the hints for each one of the areas that we're going to cover today. Now, the first hint that we're going to discuss about is objective or a goal. When you should, uh, I'm sorry, this is not a goal, it's objective or summary. Uh, sorry about that. You should say objective or summary. Objective or goal is the same. Now, when you should use uh, an objective in your resume? You should use an objective if you have, again, less than five years of working experience. 
If you have more than five years, then you should use uh, a summary because now you have all the experience or at least many years of experience working. So the and, and this the objective or the summary, it's your sales pitch. It's the sales pitch that you're gonna use to grab the attention of the human resource people and to let them know why you qualify for the job. Specifically for the objective, you should write your objective using user center objective writing. What is that? What is user center objective writing? Well, it means that you have to provide the information so that you must let them know that you are looking for the job that they are offering, that you have the qualifications to do the job, and you have the specific skills to do it. So you should, and again, you should personalize this. You should uh, benefit of the highly customization of your resume. So you should use the organization's name, if you already know it, the specific position title that you're looking for. And again, a brief, really brief outline of how you can help the company to achieve its goals, to fulfill the requirements of the person they are looking for. And again, you should be able to ask these questions when with your use objective. You know, what kind of job do I want? What kind of job am I qualified for? What kind of skills or qualifications do I possess? And again, as you can see, there are some examples about how you should provide this information. Right? You got to be as specific as the information, again, a position as an informational technology, that the position for whom? For General Electric, providing opportunities to use my communication and problem solving skills in a dynamic environment. Again, you are trying to be as specific as possible, provided information about your objective. What's the difference with the summary? In the summary, you mean that you have more years of experience. So in this case, you should include how many years of experience do you have? What are the key roles that you have had in your previous jobs? and also kind of skills and qualifications that you possess. And here you have to be more specific. You have to align your summary statement with the company's job requirement. This is very important. It's the same in the objective, but here you have a chance to be more specific. For instance, let's check this example. It's an engineer who has 14 years of experience in the finance industry leading information technology projects at the risk management area. Known for developing high performance teams, supports efforts to develop technical solutions to both internal and external clients. As you can see, we include all this information, how many years we have, what are the key roles that we have had, and the skills and qualifications that supports that key roles that we have. Mainly, as you can see in this example, this summary is aiming for a job in a manager's position or in a project management position, in which kind of industry, in the finance industry, in specifically in the information technology area. So as you can see, we have to be as specific as possible so we can match our talents, our qualifications, our skills to the company's job requirements. That's one of the main tips, and that's very, very important that you should do in your summary or also in your goal or objective. Now, about education. Um, this is something really important, and, and I actually had a chance to experience this. Uh, if you're looking for a job abroad, again, maybe in the US or Canada or the UK, Australia, whatever, if you have studied something, the language, uh, or maybe a specific program or degree in that country, many people uh, state that your education should be in the second page of your resume. But if you have, as, an, as a, 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 a people that is not from uh, the country that are looking for that job, if you have studied something, move it to the first page. In other words, if you study something in the US, and you're looking for a job in the US, move your education in the first page because you're letting 
That way you let the employer know that you have experience with the language, with the people, with communication, because that's one of the things that some employers uh, are trying to figure out when you're hiring somebody that is not from their country. Will she or she able to communicate properly with my staff, with my team? So if you have studied in the country that you're looking for that job, move that to the front. That's my recommendation. Also, in the education, include any certification or specialization that you have earned. If you are a project manager professional, you have any specific, uh, you know, as ITIL, Six Sigma, uh, you name it, Scrum Master, whatever, include that in your education. And again, it is something that is critical for the employer. Maybe you should mention that in your summary or in your objective. Again, your education, if it's from the same country, you're looking for a job, move it to the front. For the other one, for the other hand, for the other side of the story, if you just uh, graduated from school and you want to get a job abroad, you may or may not consider to state your GPA. What is your GPA? It's your grade point average. In other words, what was your average uh, points during your career, during your undergraded level? And again, I'm providing this table as an example of how did you translate for the US mainly your grade to their average point that they have. You have an A, A minus, B, B plus, B minus. And again, if you're using this in your resume, if you have, for instance, something above 90 in your career, then you should put an A, not an A minus. You should say that you got an A. And that's mainly for reference. Now, regarding your degree, what is your education degree level? Uh, everybody that made a career uh, or, or have what we call in Mexico a licenciatura, it's a bachelor's degree. That is the second bullet, a bachelor's degree. And as you can see, it's also called the undergraduate level. Bachelor's degree or undergraduate level, it means una licenciatura. And it's a program that will take around four years. Now, associate degrees is what we have in Mexico, like carreras técnicas, that it's shorter, it's only two years, uh, and again, it provides you with some skills, but they are not the same as a bachelor's degree. Master's degree and doctoral degrees, both of them are known as graduate levels. I mean, graduate programs could include master's degree or doctoral degree, and most of the times, doctoral degrees in the U.S. are known as PhDs or Doctor of Philosophy, but again, depending on which is the uh, you know the specific area of expertise that you study, it may be different. But again, this is uh, information that I provide for you in order to again you show that you know the language and you're providing information in the right way. Now, moving on to the work experience. What about work experience? Uh, this is really important. When you're writing your work experience, you should provide a description of your duties and achievements in bullets and using action verbs. This is really important. It is the same in Spanish. It also applies in English. You should provide all your duties or achievements using action verbs. Also, and we're going to look at a moment what is an action verb. Also, you should use parallel verbs or parallel writing while you're, work, while you're writing your work experience. Because both of these uh, tools are going to help you, again, to show that you're proficient with the language. You should also use past tense in your descriptions unless you are currently working uh, or interning in the company. And again, if you're talking about achievements, achievements are always in past. Now, while you're describing your positions, remember to emphasize any responsibilities that involve handling money, handling people, dealing with customers, or any important key role or key work that you find in the profile that the company is looking for. So that's also really important. You should include this information, key roles, key positions, key certifications, key language, 
in your summary and in your work experience. That's why we were talking about you have to customize each one of your resumes. That way you will be more successful in getting that interview. Now, this is also really important. Do not exaggerate or lie about your job duties. That's really important. I mean, again, big companies or companies that actually have the best positions, they're going to do a really good job doing a background check about your jobs, about your experience. Uh, they're really going to talk about with your personal references. So you don't want to lie. Honestly, it should be your best policy. And again, it's better to be honest rather than tell something that in the end they're going to find out that was not true and it's going to put you in a worse position. Now, what happens if you do not have work experience that relates to the job that you're seeking? Again, using the previous techniques, uh, try to provide details about the skills that you do possess for the job that you're looking for. And let me give you an example. Maybe uh, you have the skills or qualifications to be a project manager, and you have been you have been a project manager for several years in the IT area. But now you want to try to look for a job in the banking area. You have the skills as a project manager, but you do not have the experience in the banking industry. That means that you should focus your resume in highlighting the skills that you do possess so that you can manage to get at least the interview that will help you explain why do you feel and know are qualified for the job. And again, something that is going to help you anyway, if you try to study a program in an associate level or at any other way of, of a specific curriculum, that will help you to improve your chance of getting a job. In other words, maybe you should try to study a master in finance or just, again, an associate level in accounting, something that relates to the new industry that you want to move on. That will help a lot. Now, coming back about what do I mean by using action verbs and parallel verbs? Why is it important to use action verbs? Because that will help that your statements, either of achievements or duties, will be more persuasive, concise, and easier to, for readers to understand. Action verbs are always more convincing than non-action verbs. And let's look at this example. In this example, this is kind of a duty. Was the boss of a team of six service employees? That's not an action verb. Let's see the same example as an action verb. Supervise a team of six service employees. And you can see the difference. And it's just, it's the same information, but the way you write it, it, make, it makes it easier to understand and it's more persuasive. I mean, supervise a team of six service employees. So you should always use action verbs to describe skills, jobs, or accomplishments. And again, it's going to help you to highlight the tasks that you can do. And you better be very careful about how you use them. Again, and there's a specific list. There are a list of action verbs for different skills. Communication skills, creative skills, data or financial skills, if you analyze information for data mining, etc. Helping skills or support. Management or leadership skills. It's also very important for managers. Efficiency skills, if you're a process improvement facilitator. Research skills, mainly if you're going to do some work in academia or a specific area of chemistry, for instance. Teaching skills, technical skills. And again, I'm not going to review all of these uh, different types of action verbs that you could use. Uh, I'm providing a link at the end and doing the presentation about all the difference in uh, action verbs that you can find and how to use them. And again, the web provides a lot of resources that are really well written to help you to understand how to use these action verbs. Now, just a quick word regarding accomplishment. With accomplishment, along using action verbs, let me give you this uh, recommendation. 
you should know for each one of your accomplishments while you're writing it. And this also applies in your Spanish resume. For each accomplishment, you should know what is the problem or the challenge that you solve? What is the actual action that you did? And what was the result of benefit of that action? Because it is an accomplishment. Now, you should express your accomplishment in the following way. First, you're going to use the verb. Then, you're going to put the result of benefit. And if you have a metric, it's always better. If you pro could provide a metric of, if you said, I reduce time, how much time? In days, in hours, in a percentage. I increase the sales, in how much? I mean, you should try to provide a way to measure the impact of your accomplishment, ultimately. And again, sometimes in IT, it's difficult to do that, or in software development. How do I measure the impact that I have? In the end, your job reflects something. I mean, you help to reduce mistakes, you help to decrease time, you help to finish earlier. You can always try to track down where was ultimately the benefit of your actions. For instance, let's look at some examples. Number one, first, action verb, increase. There is my action verb. Increase what? Product by 30%. That's the result of benefit in a metric. Productivity by 30% in the credit card underwriting process. Now, how do you do it? As a result of implementing lean cell processes and training the credit initiation staff in lean best practices. And again, that's the actions that we did to accomplish the increased productivity by 30%. Now, as you can see, I've never mentioned the problem or challenge that we solved. This information, you, you are not going to include that information in your resume. That's something that you save for the interview. But as you can see, again, this is another example of using action verbs. You are more precise and persuasive about the goals or achievements that you have had during your work experience. You're selling yourself. You're selling your work, providing accurate information about the benefits that you make it happen. And again, another example is, and this one does not have a metric. And as you can see, when it does not have a metric, uh, it, it provides a good impact, but it's always better when you actually manage to measure it. Improve data protection and security, incorporate data by implementing backup and high availability services for Unix and Oracle databases. And again, it's the same. The action bar improved. What did you improve? Data protection and security incorporate data. How do I do that? By implementing backup and blah, blah, blah. And again, this is something that you should practice also in Spanish and in English regarding of how to express your work experience. Now, what about parallel structure in professional writing? This is something really important that you should apply in everything that you write in English. Parallel structure, it means that you're consistent with your wording. You're consistent in your writing. That is something that is called parallelism. And it's something that makes a huge difference and let your employers or anybody else know that you are for the language. Let's review, and it's really simple. It's not as hard as you think. For instance, let's review the example. What is something that does not have parallelism? My degree, my work experience, and ability to complete complicated projects qualify me for the job. It's not parallel. Why? Look at the parallel example. My degree, my work experience, and my ability to complete complicated projects qualify me for the job. There is a subtle difference. And you could say, you know, it's not that big. I mean, it's a my ability, but it looks bad. I mean, it shows that you're not a good writer. And the same applies for Spanish and English. You want that your resume does not have any mistake at all. It should be perfect. And in order to be perfect, you have to use parallel structure. 
Again, this is a common mistake that we non-native speakers do. We are not part of our own structures. And even sometimes native speakers do that too. But again, this is our resume, so it has to be perfect. For instance, let's check another example. This is because we're going to use bullets to express our duties or our accomplishments. So we should always use the same wording, the same format. For instance, prepare weekly field payroll, material purchasing, expediting, and returning, recording regulated documentation, change orders, maintain hard copies of field documentation. Many of the bullets does not have the same structure. What is the correct way? And it's the same information. Change, prepare, handle, record it, process, maintain. It's the same info. The only difference is we have, and that's what is called, a parallel structure to provide the information about our working experience. And again, we can spend two hours talking about parallel work, parallel writing. Instead of that, I'm providing you a very good resource. And again, you will find lots of resources on the web about how to write with parallel structure. And again, it's not that hard, and it's something really easy to do, and shows a lot of proficiency in your writing. And this applies not only for your resume, but for any other type of text that you would like to write in English. Parallel writing. Now. Let's talk about design, the design of your resume. What are some things about this? And again, this is also common in Spanish. Uh, most of the human resources staff will spend at most 35 seconds to look at your resume. And most of the time, they're, gonna, they're, they're only going to look at the first page. And with that look of 20 to 35 seconds, they're going to make a decision if you qualify or not for the job. So you want to make sure that in order to be one at least of the candidates that are going to be called or selected for the screening process, then you should design your resume such that employees at the first glance of your resume are going to know that you are the man for the job. Now, how do you do that? This is regarding the quadrant test. What is the quadrant test? And I'm going to go to the example. This is your resume. This is the first page of your resume. So you divide your resume in four quadrants. And typically, the human resources staff, what is going to do? They're going to focus first in the first quadrant. They're going to read all the information about in the first quadrant. So one important recommendation in this is that you should, you know, you already know that the reader is going to be focused in his sight, his reading, in the first two quadrants, in quadrants number one and two. They're going to focus their reading in this first two quadrants. So you have to put key information in these first two quadrants so that they know that your curriculum, your resume, is a good match for the job. So you should focus on writing a really well summary or objective uh, for, of, of your career, you should also provide in the very first quadrant information that let them know maybe education or your uh, qualifications or your skills that going to let them know that you are a good candidate for the job. And you also need to provide some balance, some balance between what the black space or the empty space and the text that you put. As you can see, this is a good example. Oops. As you can see, there is a balance between the white space and the text that you can find in your resume. That is something you have to aim. You should not charge all the information in just one side of your resume. You want it to build it so that it looks like it's well balanced text side on the second and fourth quadrant, also main headings in the first and third, so that you look, your resume actually looks good. I mean, it looks balanced, it looks well written, it provides the right information in the key places, but again, it should be the first and second quadrant. 
So you should follow these tips about, you already know what is the profile that you're looking for. So provide that information in the first and second quadrants and bring balance to your resume. A good way to bring balance to your resume is use columns to lay out your resume. Many of us uh, like to use tabs when we're building a resume. That is a really bad idea. Again, it's difficult and it makes it more uh, uh, troublesome to try to edit. And specifically, if you want to do a lot of changes and have more than one resume, if you use tabs, it's going to be more difficult. Use tables. And again, you can tell your specific word processor of choice to hide. In this case, I left all the lines of my table to be visible so that you can see the way that I use the table. But again, here is an example of how you can use a tool to lay out your resume. And that way, it will be easier for you to distribute the text so that you can have this type of design using tables. And again, the recommendation should be you should use no more than three tables on your resume. Three, sorry, three columns on your tables of your resume. And again, put important information in columns one and two. And be aware of your column count. And if you're going to use tabs or indent information, that also counts as a column. So try to use no more than three while you're writing your resume. And again, as you can see here, I'm showing working experience the name of the company, the years that the person was working in that company, the title or the position, the responsibility in one phrase, and two goals, for instance. And again, action verb, what was the result? Decrease waiting time by 50%. How do you do it? Through implementing a new check-in process. And again, something really short, well specific provides information about your accomplishment and again this should be a match to the kind of work or the kind of profile that the employer is looking for and again using your columns using your tables you try to provide balance in your text and your white space of your columns Now, another design hint, and this is really important. This is what we call the 20 second test. Once you finish designing your resume, once you spend all the time providing that specific information in the first and second quarters, and including all the key qualifications, all the key skills in with support in your working experience, in your achievements, in your resume, you should ask someone other than you, obviously, to read your resume and tie them and tell them, you have 20 seconds. Read my resume as far as you can go in 20 seconds and ask them why he or she learned about you. Does your reader notice in 20 seconds what are your skills, what are your achievements, what are the main the qualifications that you have if they do and that matches the job descriptions or the job qualifications that the employer is looking for then you have an effective resume they he or she should do that in 20 seconds if they did not acquire this information in those 20 seconds you had to go back and redesign it change it and that's something really really important that you honestly want to do if you really want to land an interview if you really want to be effective in your process of looking for a job spend time customizing your resume it's the same in spanish this applies also in english and in spanish 20 seconds that's the average time that honestly the people of human resources use to check your data so be specific be aggressive, be persuasive, don't lie, and provide all the support of your qualifications in your achievements, in your duties, or if applies also in your academic background. That's something really important. So, in order to conclude, 
Let's do a final check. So these are the main items that you need to uh, review once you finish your resume. First, did you actually utilize wisely the free space? If not, you should do go back, do your quadrant test, and help yourself with tables to to distribute in a right way and in an accurate way all of your text. So you want to avoid that your resume looks cluttered with too much information or too few. And again, if you are just a, some student that just graduated and is looking for a job, don't overcompensate. Do not use a font that is big. Don't try to make it all big so it can fit in one page. Be honest, just provide a good looking resume with accurate, accurate information and that will be enough. Stay away from paragraphish descriptions. And again, use bullets. That's the best way to provide information. If you're gonna, gonna write a paragraph, make it really, and I'm gonna, again, use this example, use a small paragraph. It's two lines long, no longer than that. A paragraph that is three lines long, it's too much, at least for an English speaker. Somebody from the US or Canada, they want the information in very specific words. Get to the point. So again, stay away from paragraphish, use bullets, use action verbs, and use parallel structure. Review your summary. And again, your summary, all the information in your summary should be supported in detail in your resume. Qualifications, skills, achievements. Again, did you check that all relevant keywords are included? What keywords? The keywords that come in the profile, in the job description that the employers are looking for. So all those keywords, all those key language skills should match your resume. And finally, is the resume completely free of any misspellings or typos? Again, the same person that is going to do your, it's going to uh, uh, help you to do the 20 second test will, can also help you to check the spelling of your document. And again, in these cases, maybe you will really want somebody who is proficient in English to check your resume. Um, and again, there's also a lot of people uh, in schools or even here in, in campus that could help you with that if you need. All right. So this is mainly the, the main topics that I wanted to cover, uh, talking about how to grab your resume. So now, uh, if you please let me know, either in Spanish or in English, don't worry, uh, about uh, the questions that you may have regarding uh, these topics. Uh, about how to create your document, uh, how to uh, specific things about action verbs, parallelism, I don't know, of any of the, of the different things that you have been reviewing. So, uh, please, if you have any questions, could you please let me know through the chat? And again, it can be in English and Spanish, don't worry. And again, in the meantime, uh, yes, and this is a good question. Uh, Ernesto Pedraza pregunta, ¿esta información aplica también para LinkedIn? No. Fíjate que para LinkedIn, lo que yo te recomiendo es que no subas tu currículum completo a LinkedIn. Sube un resumen de tu resumen. O sea, LinkedIn tienes que igual hacer más especies. Por ejemplo, ¿qué es lo que yo no incluiría en LinkedIn? Tus, este, todo lo que son tus, tus logros. Sí podrías incluir lo que es la parte de tus, es, de tu, la descripción de tus actividades, de tu puesto, pero no pongas tus logros, porque también lo que no quieres es, sobre todo en LinkedIn, este, que sea tu currículum completo, sino más bien es como todavía algo más sintetizado, mucho más, este, Vista negocio, eh, lo que, la información que te ofreces. Finalmente, ya en una entrevista proveerás la información completa. Pero sí, definitivamente no es... Eh, yo no haría un copy-paste de tu currículum a LinkedIn. En LinkedIn yo pondría todavía algo más profesional. Y sí te recomendaría que lo pusieras tanto en español y en inglés. 
Este, eso sí es muy importante. El LinkedIn, súmalo en los dos idiomas, es muy, y ténganlo actualizado. Otra recomendación que les doy ahorita que me enseñaron la parte de LinkedIn, es que si ahorita están trabajando, no importa que estén trabajando, es ahora el momento adecuado que ustedes hagan las conexiones en LinkedIn. Sobre todo si ustedes trabajan en proyectos y de repente están en diferentes empresas, en cada una de esas diferentes empresas, inmediatamente tengan su LinkedIn actualizado, su perfil actualizado, y hagan conexiones con la gente. Es más fácil hacerlo cuando están dentro que cuando están fuera. Y eso les va a ayudar mucho, sobre todo cuando los pues quieran estar buscando opciones diferentes de trabajo. Ahora, Angélica Ortega, ¿es bueno dar certificaciones internas? Sí, agréguenlas. Y te digo, si son varias y son cosas que están solicitando para las descripciones de trabajo, tanto en México como en Estados Unidos o Canadá, incluyanlas en su objetivo, incluyanlas en su resumen profesional, porque es muy importante que inmediatamente den, se den cuenta, sin tener que leerlo todo, que ustedes tienen esas certificaciones que están buscando. Ahora, ¿cómo puedes hablar sobre los beneficios de trabajo usando su ejemplo? Reducción, desarrollando ah, un gran sistema. Por ejemplo, si tú estás desarrollando un gran sistema, ese sistema tiene un objetivo. O sea, es, ese sistema tiene un objetivo. Tienes que llegar hasta el último punto de cuál es el beneficio de ese gran sistema. Si ese sistema, aún, por ejemplo, me voy a ir todavía un grado antes, ¿no? Si, si ya terminaste el, ese sistema y ya se implementó, ¿cuál fue el beneficio de ese sistema? Y ese es el beneficio. Ahora, si todavía ese sistema está en desarrollo, pero el logro que tú tuviste ya tuvo algún beneficio, entonces, de nuevo, trata de entender ese beneficio que tú tuviste, cómo ayudó al proyecto. Que aunque esté en Boeing, lo debe haber ayudado en alguna forma. Sé que esa es la parte un poquito complicada, pero siempre hay que buscar este, llegar al último logro. Ahora, si es un equipo de siete personas, no importa. Si tú eres parte de ese equipo, es tú contribuiste a ese esfuerzo. Si tú contribuiste a ese esfuerzo, tú puedes, obviamente, estar como parte del equipo de trabajo que tú contribuiste a ese desarrollo. Y aplica sobre todo para proyectos grandes. En un proyecto grande, tú fuiste parte de un equipo que logró ese objetivo. Y así lo puedes colocar. Sí, sí, claro que sí puedes incluir eh, ese beneficio, aunque haya sido de forma grupal. Es algo de lo cual tú formaste parte de un cierto aprendizaje. Obviamente, tú tienes que, de cierta forma, pasearlo, de que se vea de que estás contribuyendo con esa parte. Perdón, en cuanto a la presentación, la presentación va a estar disponible entre mañana y pasado. Eh, como les recuerdo, toda la sesión está siendo grabada y la presentación va a estar disponible junto con el video en el portal de YouTube de Software Room. Este, y, y les digo, ¿no? lo, lo importante es, si ustedes realmente quieren este, trabajar en el extranjero, mi recomendación de nuevo, es que la forma más sencilla que lo pueden hacer, yo sé que igual no es tan sencillo, pero es estudien algo en el país que se quieran ir. Es lo más sencillo. Vayan a ese país, estudien algo, un associate degree de dos años o de un año, y con eso ya créanme que sus posibilidades de conseguir un trabajo suben como no tienen una idea. Porque eso fue lo que yo hice cuando estuve trabajando en Estados Unidos. ¿Qué hay de cursos sobre plataformas como Coursera? ¿Es recomendable agregarlos? Si son relevantes para el trabajo, sí. O sea, sí, yo los, yo los incluiría. Finalmente, Coursera es una plataforma que todo el mundo conoce. Finalmente, si es un tema específico que se está... Un, un tema del cual tú ya tomaste un curso y lo está pidiendo el empleador, sí, incluye. En cuanto a cuestión de diseños, alguna página de currículum... Eh, las páginas que yo les estoy dando aquí tienen algunos ejemplos. ¿no? Los links que les estoy poniendo como Sources of Reference tienen ejemplos eh, en inglés de cómo pudieran estar armando sus currículum. Entonces, ahora, estas páginas son, como verán, muy específicas Estados Unidos y Canadá. ¿no? Obviamente para Reino Unido, etc., es un formato similar que sí les podría servir. ¿Qué recomiendas para buscar oportunidades de trabajo que no sean outsourcing? 
Pues, mira, como te digo, si son en el extranjero, que estudies algo. Si son aquí en México, eh, finalmente, si tú haces un buen currículum, eso es lo que te da de entrada a la entrevista. Ya para la entrevista entra una estrategia diferente. Pero en ese aspecto, haz mucho énfasis en tu experiencia, haz mucho énfasis en tus logros, o sea, véndete bien, o sea, para que finalmente no sea de un outsourcing, sino sea directamente con la empresa, fíjate qué es lo que la empresa está buscando, fíjate qué es lo que ellos buscan, el perfil, y que tu currículum haga ese match con ese perfil, y que realmente tu experiencia pues, sea, sea la que ellos buscan, esa es la forma en que finalmente tú puedes lograr tener un obtener esa posición que no necesariamente es de sino es de planta en alguna empresa. Ahora, eh, igual, eh, en Estados Unidos, etcétera, hay, eh, aquí en México no sé, pero en Estados Unidos, por ejemplo, hay eh, buscadores de trabajo específicos de IT, que son de trabajos de IT. Entonces, eh, ahorita se me fue el nombre de cuál es uno, eh, pero nada más googleenlo, créanme, hay, hay, hay muchas opciones, y créanme, o sea, la, la opción de irse para allá, si ustedes dominan el idioma y tienen digo, certificaciones que les ayuden, les, les va a dar, ah, mira, de hecho es este CyberCover, por ejemplo, CyberCover, que es uno específico de IT que está en Estados Unidos, ¿no? Y son datos muy específicos de TEI, ¿no? Es como un OCC, pero específico de TEI. Y ahí pueden ver, este, pero igual hay muchísimas este, opciones ¿no? de trabajo en distintas este, estados. ¿no? Pues no sé si tengan eh, dudas adicionales. Perdón que no incluyera mis datos de contacto, se me pasó. Este, como les comento, yo estoy en Software Group. Si ustedes se meten a la página de SG Campus y se registran, pues finalmente cualquier correo que manden a SG Campus a mí me llega. Entonces yo lo puedo revisar. Ay, caray, perdón, no vi la pregunta de 50 años. Pero, pues, ya es que tenemos experiencia en alta dirección y gerencia, pero nos tenemos 50 años, ¿qué nos para que no se le mire etapas temprana del proceso? Eh, de nuevo, no incluyamos eh, fechas de nacimiento, no incluyamos edades, no incluyamos sexo, o pues, sea, eso no lo incluyamos. O sea, eh, eso es muy importante. Sobre todo para gente de alta dirección, eh, la realidad es que cuando son puestos de alta dirección, no, no buscan gente joven, sino buscan gente madura. Y yo creo que tú eliminando primero ese impedimento de no hay que poner la edad, no hay que poner este, ni el sexo, pero bueno, obviamente se infiere del nombre. Pero no pongamos esa información y más bien, de nuevo, enfoquémonos en que el club haga clic para tener esa llamada. Y ya teniendo esa llamada, si en el momento nos preguntan que a mí me ha pasado, me hablan y me preguntan, ¿no? ¿Y qué edad tiene? Ah, pues obviamente no le voy a denegar la pregunta, ¿no? Ah, pues tengo tantos años de edad, pero simplemente en ese momento es tu oportunidad. Estás hablando con los recursos humanos y le, pero tengo experiencia que buscan, he manejado tales cosas. O sea, tienes que tener tú, tu sales pitch, tienes que tener tú, tu, tu argumento de venta de, sin importar la edad, ¿Por qué tú eres? Qué, cali, ¿Qué cualificaciones tienes para el trabajo que están buscando? O sea, entonces, en ese aspecto de la edad, te digo, lo que recomendaría es no pongas tu fecha de nacimiento, te digo, no pongas foto, no pongas este CURP ni, ni RFC, más bien enfócate a tu experiencia, a tu, este, a tu experiencia, ¿no? ¿Recomiendas publicar el currículum de ese mundial? Sí, sí te lo recomiendo, porque aunque no lo creas, hay personas que sí lo checan o que sí buscan. Y lo que te recomiendo es, eh, si realmente estás buscando cambiar o obtener una opción de trabajo, contratas la opción donde tienes varios currículum, para que tú cuando apliques a una empresa, puedas enviarle un currículum específico. Porque lo malo de OCC es que su, este, digamos, su opción sin costo nada más te deja tener un currículum. Pero para que realmente sea efectiva tu búsqueda de trabajo, necesitas, y a veces está flojera, pero tienes que generar un currículum para cada tipo de este, perfil. Al menos de perfil. No te digo para empresa, pero sí para perfil. 
Entonces, igual y te cuesta una lanita, pero es una lanita que vas a pagar, no sé, por los próximos seis meses, un año. Échale así. Todavía el promedio estaba, creo que en un año, para que encontraras un trabajo, te cambiaras de trabajo seis meses. Pero va a ser más rápido que tú ganes una entrevista si entregas un currículum personalizado. Te va a ayudar mucho. ¿Cuáles son los trabajos de trabajo serias? Mira, eh, yo en lo personal eh, me ha funcionado OCC, me ha funcionado las directas con las empresas. A veces se nos olvida que Bayer, eh, empresas grandes, farmacéuticas, bancos, este, aseguradoras, eh, empresas de tecnología tienen sus propias bolsas. Esas son buenas bolsas. Las mismas que están directamente con las empresas, eh, las bolsas como OCC, te digo, a mí me han ayudado en el pasado. Eh, Boomerang en su momento era buena, la verdad es que últimamente no la he visto tan buena como antes. La verdad, no sé, no hablaría mal de ellos, pero eh, finalmente cuando yo entré a trabajar al banco fue a través de una vacante de Boomerang. Pero últimamente como que he visto que más bien ya no está tan buena como antes, ¿no? Pero yo te recomendaría OCC, aquí en México, yo te recomendaría las directamente con los trabajos, o sea, las directamente con las empresas. Este, ¿Qué más? Yo no te recomendaría que pagues un headhunter, yo más bien, te, o sea, búscate un headhunter que te cobre comisión ya que tengas el trabajo, no que te cobre comisión antes de conseguirte un trabajo. O sea, los mejores headhunters son los que te cobran ya que tienes tu trabajo, no antes. Si vas a buscar un headhunter, haz eso. Y igual, existen muchas otras, está la de Michael Page, están muchas de esas que son ya para diferentes perfiles. Los pueden usar, yo lo que recomiendo es que busquen más bien bolsas de trabajo, por ejemplo, más específicas. Nosotros aquí en SG tenemos la DSG Talento. Y SG Talento, como pueden ver, son perfiles muy clavados en TI. Nosotros lo que hacemos es, a los ADECOs, a los Manpowers, etcétera, tenemos convenio con ellos y compartimos información, ¿no? Bajo ciertos acuerdos, cuando están buscando candidatos. Entonces, por ejemplo, los ADECOs, los Manpowers, etcétera, también. Igual, por ejemplo, si ustedes quieren consultoras, váyanse directamente a la bolsa de trabajo de la consultora. Todas tienen Deloitte, Ernst Young, KPMG, tienen sus propias bolsas de trabajo. Ah, ¿qué es un headhunter? Un headhunter es una persona que su chamba es como un consultor independiente de recursos humanos. Ellos se dedican a cubrir vacantes de empresas medianas a grandes, de tal manera que, por ejemplo, por darte un ejemplo, ¿no? O sea, si Bayer está buscando un ingeniero de software, entonces un headhunter le dice, ah, mira, yo te traigo un ingeniero de software, se lo presenta a Bayer, a Bayer, y si Bayer dice, ah, a mí me gustan, te contratan, y al headhunter le dan una lana. Hay headhunters que no solo cobran a la empresa, sino también le cobran a veces a, a las personas que están buscando trabajo. Eh, yo, la verdad, nunca he usado uno que te cobre, más bien yo he tenido contacto con gente de recursos humanos que directamente te dice, ah, bueno, si yo te consigo una chamba, pues bueno, ¿no? a mí me van a dar una comisión. ¿No? Y finalmente, headhunters son muchos que tú vas a ver en OCC. En OCC hay muchos headhunters, que son empresas exclusivas que se dedican a, este, que le trabajan a, a, por ejemplo, a empresas grandes, bancos, aseguradoras, etc. Ellos son headhunters. Entonces, por ejemplo, un headhunter, cuando tú haces contacto con ellos, tú mismo les puedes decir, oye, si para esta vacante no quedo, considérame para otras o avísame para otras. Ahí les voy a dar otro tip. Ustedes siempre que vayan a una entrevista, vayan con sus tarjetas de presentación. Y si no están trabajando, no importa, manden a hacer sus tarjetas de presentación. Porque los headhunters o las agencias eh, ya puestas, conservan eso. Igual es su currículum lo tiran o lo archivan. Pero una tarjeta de presentación la conservan. Entonces de repente ellos también les ayuda a acordarse. ¿no? Es más fácil buscar una tarjeta que un currículum. ¿Vale? Bueno, pues de nuevo les agradezco mucho su presencia. 
Eh, les recuerdo nada más los avisos. Eh, ahorita en noviembre vamos a iniciar cursos en, en SF Campus. Tenemos el de Ingeniería de Requisitos de Software orientado al negocio. Este inicia el 10 de noviembre. Y este en específico les otorga 10 PDUs para su certificación de TMP. También tenemos manejo de resolución efectiva de conflictos, que inicia el 11 de noviembre. Y panorama ejecutivo del desarrollo de app móviles, este el 18. Eh, también le recordamos que tenemos la gira Intel, que inicia de nuevo el 18 de noviembre en la Ciudad de México. La información de la sede estará disponible en su momento, en la liga que les anexo. Eh, perdón, la feria virtual de Nista. Esta ya pasó, una disculpa, que nos pasó, esta feria ya no está. Y bueno, los invitamos al webinar de la semana que entra, que son todas las claves para gestionar un proyecto de forma eficiente. De nuevo, muchas gracias eh, por su asistencia. Eh, vamos a estar habilitando el video en la presentación en nuestro canal de YouTube. Y de nuevo, ¿no? Cualquier correo que, que quieran mandarme, eh, déjenme se los pongo aquí, todavía se ve. ¿Dónde está el texto? El texto, el texto, el texto, el texto. ¿Dónde me está jalando? Uno, bueno, se los mando por el chat. Esta es sus órdenes para cualquier duda que tengan, sugerencia o, o cualquier otro tema que no hayamos tratado durante la presentación. De nuevo, que tengan muy buena tarde, les agradezco su presencia y primero Dios nos estamos viendo la semana que entra. Que tengan una excelente tarde. Hasta luego.